All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this talk. So we're quite pleased to present our work um, over work underemployed and underpaid. So it's a joint work with uh, with Lawrence Dacuigui and Rika Soler of the DLSU School of Economics. Uh, admittedly, we just started this work a couple of weeks ago in preparation for the joint workshop of the DLSU and uh, NIDA, so uh, National Institute of Development Administration based in Bangkok, Thailand. So um, we're still uh, um, waiting for the last waves of the labor force survey. So, but uh, at this point, we're able to gather some insights, or uh, the data was able to give us some insights about the labor market dynamics during the COVID nineteen pandemic. So, at, at, at any point you have questions, so please do uh, let uh, do let us know if you have clarifications as well. So, we'd like to really improve the the uh, this work. So, we're, we're hoping to finish this uh, the final paper within the month. So. Uh, why are we interested in the, the labor market dynamics during the COVID-19 pandemic? So we're pretty uh, you know, aware of the reversal of economic gains that has happened among developing countries, and the Philippines is not exempted from these uh, exogenous shocks. So among the most uh, vulnerable during the crisis were, were, were women, uh, were children, and, were, and mostly the, the poor, th those who are disadvantaged, uh, economic situations and a lot of the workers during the time of the pandemic were actu actually moved out of their uh, of their present of their uh, previous employment, and so uh, we thought that um, uh, because the pandemic has brought unprecedented effects to the labor market, we thought of actually analyzing what happened and what were uh, what happened particularly for this paper for those who are presently underemployed. So if we're going to look at the economic strategies of most countries, we have seen that a lot of the economies were able, would be able to go back to their pre-pandemic situations, like in this, this year or the next year. However, we surmise that the human capital of these countries will take a longer time to recover. So specifically in the aspect of uh, training, in the aspect of labor market transition, or to, to, to attain a gainful and uh, productive employment will take a longer time for specifically for uh, certain segments of the population. So we thought that it would be good to understand or to unpack some of these struggles of our workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we found is that the fractures in our labor market are already existing even before, before the crisis. And the crisis was just able to unfold this into our, you know, in the present situation. So uh, definitely we need to think about forward thinking labor policies uh, we need to take uh, to think about uh, the the work life balance of workers, and uh, we'd also have to rethink about uh, the present situation of the minimum wages in our country. So for today's event, we will be presenting uh, stylized facts on underemployment during the pandemic and a couple of preliminary insights and bits of labor policy agenda. So uh, okay, just to have a brief. Um, understanding of what the broad aim of the project is. So we're uh, in our research cluster, the DLSU School of Economics, we have a labor research cluster. So we're thinking of generating timely statistics on labor market dynamics in the Philippines through a series of papers. So we'll have uh, thematic papers on labor supply, wage returns, and human capital and educational investments. And um, as one of the first papers, this one, specifically for this project, we'd like to focus on the questions on the labor force survey to, uh, that ask individuals if they're looking for additional hours of work and if they're looking for another job throughout the pandemic. So um, a lot of us were actually, uh, were able to see the, the incidence of uh, unemployment during the pandemic, but very few people have actually asked, on, uh, have taken a look at the underemployment situation in the country. So by definition, underemployment uh, or, or or are persons who have expressed desire to have additional hours of work in their present job, okay, or to have a new job with longer hours of work. So we're going to unpack this to between those uh, workers who are working below 40 hours and those workers who are already working more than 40 hours a week. So uh, the literature on, on underemployment during the COVID-19 pandemic is actually quite, uh, there's a lot of new papers coming out in, in, in a lot of journals. So a couple of uh, literature that we're able to browse through before coming up with a, somehow a good design for this project, a couple of, uh, couple of things that we're interested to look into. All right, so what do we know already about the, uh, the employment during the COVID-19 pandemic? So 
we're able to see this. So I think this has already been uh, presented by the Philippine Statistical Authority that the average total hours were before the pandemic and after the pandemic. So we have seen that there's a decrease in the mean hours work. So even before the pandemic, most of our workers are already working more than 40 hours a week. So on, on average, I think it's about 42, 43 hours across most sectors with the exception of the agriculture sector. And during the pandemic at the, the second quarter of 2020, we have seen that the actual number of working hours decreased substantially, uh, specifically for industry and services. So uh, because of mobility restrictions, because of, uh, because of um, lockdown rules, we're able to see that the total number of working hours have decreased it has slightly recovered, although the average working hours between the pre-COVID and the COVID-19 periods, they still appear to be substantially lower than before. So, uh, okay, so this is what we uh, have seen from the uh, uh, from the statistics presented by the PSA, that the uh, among those who are underemployed, we are seeing that, of course, obviously majority of them are not working close to 40 hours a week. Uh, denoted by the blue bars and we're also seeing that uh, a lot of the workers who are who are uh, who desire more working hours are those who are already working for more the more than 40 hours as denoted by the by the orange line so we're seeing here that uh, there are more workers despite working let's say 40 hours a week or five days a week they're still asking for more hours of work so we'd like to find out the reasons why all right so what's the contribution to the labor policy discussion in the Philippines for this work? So the empirical literature on underemployment and labor supply, basically this is where we would like to go into. The, the, the linkage between the underemployment and the labor supply during the pandemic in a developing country setting. And uh, specifically, we thought that seemingly the, uh, the discussion on pay and wages with social protection among workers in the Philippines appear to be disparate issues. Whenever we talk about uh, worker welfare or the the work uh, the welfare the well being of our, our of our workers, uh, we don't we just think of the pay and not a, we don't think about to see the work life balance of our workers. So I think it's about time that we consider them, uh, because if we'd like to think of uh, longer term labor policies, I think it's a must. Okay, so uh, there are I think issues of precarity and vulnerability of workers during the pandemic. So which has uh, which has surfaced in the last couple of uh, months, and I, I think it it uh, it points it draws our attention to the lack of broad based social protection among our population. So I think it's a must that we talk about it if we wanted if we wanted to have workers who are productive. So I think uh, these are are issues which need to be carefully discussed. So what did we do for this project? So to provide context. In our uh, in our discussion, we started by looking at household level analysis because we're we're initially drawn to the idea of looking at what's the extent of uh, wage income inequality in the Philippines. So at the start, we are still looking at the at the family income and expenditure survey uh, during in 2018, and then we started looking at worker at, at the at worker level analysis. Uh, by pulling together the multiple waves of the labor force survey. So in total, we have more than 1 million observations for, for LFS. For the, we use the entire uh, data set for, for FIES. All right, so uh, just to begin our analysis, so we, we looked at the distribution of wage income in the country. And obviously, as what we can see, a, 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 jet, a large proportion of our population depends on wage income as us. As, as, uh, as, as, the, as the biggest share of our total income. So uh, the, lower, uh, the lower income deciles, particularly the lower, the lower half, uh, they have a higher proportion of income from seasonal jobs. So uh, we, we see that about 30 to 40% of households in the Philippines depend on wage income for, for uh, in general. So with the exception of obviously the top 10% of the population, uh, whose greater share come from other sources like entrepreneurial income, uh, pensions, and other sources. So if there are vulnerabilities in the labor markets, we can see that there would be implications to household income. And we see that it would be very, it would be quite, it, uh, it can easily push households below the poverty line, right? Particularly those who are, 
uh, drawing their income sources from uh, from seasonal from seasonal jobs. And if there are job losses, even if you have a permanent contract, like for like in the case of uh, regular wages, it can easily push households into poverty or to precarity, precarious situations. So we also thought, looked at the distribution of the total wage income. So uh, what we're seeing is that the Philippines is becoming a highly unequal society. I think the data has been uh, has been published uh, pub, uh, published quite uh, quite often. That that uh, I think we have the, one of the uh, from 2003 to 2018, the Gini coefficient in the Philippines actually has decreased, meaning that the higher proportion of our population is holding a bigger share of the total household income. Like for this one, uh, like for the top 25%, the top 25% of our population holds about half of the total household income, whereas the bottom, the middle 10% hold less than their shares and the bottom 25% only holds about 7.89%. So if we're going to imagine the extent of, uh, if we're going to refer to the previous discussion that we uh, I just gave, that um, uh, the, the, the workers who, who belong to the lower income debt are, are more vulnerable. Despite, holding, despite that uh, uh, having a larger share of their income drawing from uh, seasonal sources, it can easily uh, deprive them or of uh, of uh, of potential uh, pathways out of the poverty line. No? So, yeah. So this is, I think, uh, one thing that we need to address. Uh, we need to think about whenever we think of labor market policies that uh, we have to think about those who are the bottom of of, of our income distribution. So, uh, according to the PSA, so it's from the same data set. Uh, the labor force participation rate was uh, around 60.5 percent during 2021 to 2022 and the unemployment rate has decreased from 8.8 percent to about 6.4 percent in january of these years so we are taking a look at the likelihood of beca of uh, of um, being underemployed and we're able to see some initial statistics but what we decided is to look at the extent of underemployment across age groups. And we can see from this uh, distribution, just one moment. All right, so we'd like to see, I'd like to draw your attention to the broken lines here. And you can see the des desire for more work has actually uh, quite increased during the pandemic. So the solid lines represent the, the desire for more work across age groups. And what we can see is that those who are already aged between 50 to 55 and 55 to 60, they're still asking for more hours of work, right? Despite being, you know, uh, closer to retirement, uh, the, 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 the proportion of those workers asking for more hours of work is practically the same for those who are uh, just started their working careers at 30 to 35, right? Yeah. Okay, so for the next slide, what we did is to separate these into uh, how does the desire for more working hours vary according to the working hours rendered. So it's not surprising that those who are visibly underemployed or those who are working less than 40 hours to ask for more for more hours of work. So we can see from here that before the uh, April 2020 lockdown, that the, their, the desire is around 30%. But after the lockdown, the desire for more working hours actually increased for those visibly underemployed. However, if we're going to take a look at the uh, uh, those who are already working more than 40 hours, uh, a lot of the of them are already work uh, are, le are already asking for more than for more working hours, and the COVID-19 pandemic actually pushed them to ask for more. So, particularly those who are already working at 50 to 55 hours, their the desire for more work is higher than the national average. So, but we're, it's a bit worrying that those who are already working. At between these uh, hours of work are still asking for more. So uh, it already raises some policy questions that are these the kind of jobs that really pay for for uh, for, for 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 daily living in the in, in the Philippines. So what we found it, what is, when we uh, look at the tables no or we plotted how uh, what's the extent that uh, that the pandemic has done to the underemployment situation in the country? So obviously, I think it's not surprising that the pandemic have worsened underemployment and reduced the consumption of overtime hours among the workers. 
So from 26.1% in January 2019, uh, the percentage of workers who rendered less than 40 hours increased to 51.28% in April 2020 and decreased uh, slightly to 40.4% in April 2021. So in 2019, almost one in three rendered between 45 to 50 hours. Afterwards, it is lower in April 2020 and 2021. So if we're going to take a look at the pay, I think everyone is interested uh, at the pay of our workers. So among those visibly underemployed, if we're just going to compute uh, an average, how does the desire for more working hours uh, vary? Oh, sorry, uh, the average day, we find that the average daily wage for the visibly underemployed is severely below the minimum wage. I think it's not surprising because they don't render as much uh, working hours and it's also below the cost of living. And what we find is that even for those already working more than 40 hours a week, the average uh, daily pay is still below that of the minimum wage, at least for a lot of them and for the, for the actual cost of living in the country. I think this is largely the reason, of course, it's not really surprising anymore, but we're presenting here as an evidence that the actual wages are not uh, sufficient. Uh, but I'd like to caution as well here is that the average wages that we're reporting here are nominal wages. So we haven't adjusted for the real, um, for the real wages. So if we're going to account for, the, for inflation and the actual, uh, increase in the cost of living during this period, we could actually see that the real, uh, the actual wages uh, being received by the workers is becoming less and less across these uh, periods of the survey, right? Okay, so part of our study, uh, we're also conducting a logistic regression analysis and we're able to see that, uh, okay, I eliminated the equations here and we're able to see that during April, 2020, uh, a trigger decrease in working hours among our workers. So we have this uh, regression analysis where our dependent variable, so we segmented the, pop the, uh, the of our units of observation based on the actual number of working hours rendered during the past week. So controlling as well for the survey periods. So we're able to see a uh, decrease in working hours, hence the demand for more working hours has actually increased. So, but what we find to be interesting is that there are uh, persistent regional variations. So it reflects the uh, uh, the differences in the fundamental economic structures of our of our region. Some are definitely much more agricultural. Some are more industrialized. So that's why the desire for more working hours have have uh, are experienced differently by our population. So you can see from this chart. So we're still finalizing this and writing up the the analysis. So uh, I'd like to I'd like to uh, draw uh, finish the presentation. So uh, again, this is still an ongoing work, and we'd like to hear your insights on how to proceed on some parts of the paper. So, but we'd like to impart, you know, or raise a particular question at the end of this analysis: uh, bono, who benefits? So uh, there's a lot of precarity among our workers, and I think that's already uh, showed even before, uh, be before and, and during the pandemic. So. The pandemic has underscored the vulnerability of a significant share of Filipino workers. So the extent of underemployment in particular reflects the scope of the quality of work available and the capacity to provide living wages. I think we have to draw attention to that. So uh, we think that um, with this kind of um, analysis, we need to understand the desire for more work among those already working more than 40 hours of, per week which could be signals of the following, and they could be mutually, they could be reinforcing each other. So as we have seen that there are persistent differentials between the actual cost of living and real wages received. So definitely, uh, we have also seen that the minimum wages have not been adjusted significantly even before the pandemic. So it draws a lot of our workers to work, uh, work more, uh, to, to, rent, to ask for more work, right? Uh, there are also a lot of job contracts as shown in the LFS, which do not provide stable cash flow among our households uh, in co just by comparing re regular versus seasonal wages. And another problem is that uh, there's a lot of education, job and skill mismatch across age groups, educational backgrounds, and across periods in our, in our survey. So we also have to account for that. So um, 
um, a couple of thoughts before I end my presentation. So the Philippines in the 2020s will become a highly unequal society brought about by the pandemic. So there's, on, there's 2018 is already uh, highly unequal. So uh, the pandemic has brought about the uh, some of the uh, some opportunities are were not made available to certain segments of the population. So it could be very difficult for some of the workers to catch up. So we surmise that the underemployment may likely persist in the age of scaled up automation. So we haven't really talked about this. So I think it may it will substantially influence our labor market dynamics. So uh, temporarily, uh, underemployment. Okay, I should have mentioned this at the start. Underemployment indicates forgotten economic opportunities and the depreciation of human capital. There are studies in other fields in the social sciences that there are the fr the frictions in job search. It's, it's quite high. So some workers take a long time uh, to find a formal job contract. So in the time that they were looking for jobs, they, some of this, they could have uh, gained more skills or they could they went to certain jobs which do not fit their backgrounds and skills. So I think it's also, we need to address this substantially. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, therefore at the, at the end of the day, we could think of policies uh, for Filipino workers while living in an endemic COVID scenario. Uh, we should also think that the hybrid and flexible work may not be for everyone, but work-life balance should be, okay? Whether we are working for the government or the private sector or in the agriculture sector. So uh, we're still developing our arguments for this, uh, for this paper, but we definitely underscore the need for inclusive labor policies, which are worker-centered. And in a way, when we think, think about the reforms in the education system, we think of the learner-centered approaches to increase the uh, the quality of our education outcomes in the same way that in the labor markets, we need to think about uh, policies which are worker centered at the very beginning. So we need to upskill and reskill those at the fringes while protecting them from displacement and exclusion, whether brought about by another pandemic or by automation or by some any other, by trade market liberalization or by any other uh, reforms in the sector. So aside from the consistency of policies from training, schooling to labor market transition, so another thing that we uh, also tried, would like to emphasize is that uh, a lot of our workers would also um, be trained for entrepreneurial orientation and 21st century skills, or they should be reinforced throughout their, uh, uh, before they transition to the labor market. So I think that's it for now. So we'd be happy to hear your questions during the discussion. Thank you.